Good afternoon, everybody, once again. Today, I'm excited, we have another opportunity to learn from each other. Imagine that, growing and developing together. Today's gonna be a lot of fun, and it gives me an opportunity to talk about mm, a kind of setsudo. So let me ask you a question to, to start out. <clears throat> what is setsudo? If I turn to the shokushu, I won't read it all, but part of it, I'd like to read some nuggets here. When we realize the principles and way of the universe, the universe gives us the responsibility to spread them to the world. Remember that phrase. Do not think that you cannot help another. What you learn today, you can teach another the next day. So I bet all of you are used to this. <clears throat> you know, one day you become Shodan and you just think, I have arrived. I have a Hakama. Look at me. <laughs> but we all know show means like the front, the start, the beginning. And we never feel that we're ready, right? We're ready to be, you know, suddenly we're a black belt, we have Hakama, and now you have your class and your, you know, sensei. Well, that presents some challenges, and Toy Sensei was like all over that, and that's why he said, don't worry about rank, don't worry about it. If you learn the four basic principles at a seminar for 45 minutes, and you go, whoa, that was incredible, go home and teach your friends, your kids. You know, that, that's, that's what that means. But this, this teased me up for me to say, you know it's a great, I'm gonna use a, a, a more modern word, a startup word, you know what colleges are? They're great incubators to teach people the unification of mind and body, right? They're great because you have an audience of people whose self-identity is there in school. They're there to learn. So if you have a college in your area, if you have a junior college, a community college, or any kind of educational institution wherever you live, maybe right now is not the time, but write yourself a little sticky and say, you know what? When things hopefully get back to normal, hopefully sooner than later, whenever that is, what a great opportunity. And so I wanna take a couple of minutes to just talk about this idea of colleges as being incubators because they really have been in the key society. And I wanna share with you a couple of examples just to set up my whole enthusiasm and support for Atwater Sensei that, who, who I'll introduce in just a minute. <clears throat> I got really lucky. Guess what, where I went to college, you know what we had? We had an Aikido club. You know what it was? Shin Shin Toitsu Aikido. It's like, whoa. There I was already doing whatever I could as a ski racer, and then boom. Are you kidding me? The sheriff of Canyon County, Idaho, wants to teach Aikido at the College of Idaho, because we were in the same town. What did he do? He, need, he, was, he was a police officer from uh, San Diego. Remember, I explained that in one of the other calls. And so he said, well, I need an audience. I want to set it out. So we went to the university. And you know what was really great about that? Someone who probably thought I was like a, a gadfly, constantly following him around, it, as though I had a man crush on this guy. This huge guy, his name was Lance Tata. He was a showdown. I thought that was like a god, because he had a hakama. And he was recruited to be one of our offensive linemen. He was from the island of Kauai. So he was one of Matsumura Sensei's students. Big Hawaiian guy. Love this guy. And uh, I just couldn't get enough of him. So we were constantly training. Even though he had studies and football and all this, besides class, I would pull him aside all the time. And that was just huge. All right, graduate school, I go to the University of Hawaii. Yes, we always talk about the dojos, in my case, the Palama Dojo, which I've shared with you. But there were two psychologists who worked in the counseling office, Dr. Shig Fuji, uh, Fujishigi and Dr. George Fujita, both wonderful gentlemen. They were the ones that uh, led the Aikido program at the University of Hawaii in Manoa in Hawaii. So, and they were also members of the Palama Dojo. 
So it was totally natural when I came to Furman to say, well, well of course, you're going to start an Aikido club. And, you know, that went on for 30 years. And now uh, Stone Sensei, as you well know, because you heard from him a couple calls ago, he's keeping that legacy alive and leading and has been for a long, long time. I, we talked about that in, in some detail. Um, but, you know, that whole thing is like an incubator. Because not only do we have, for example, in the Eastern Key Federation, head instructors in New Jersey, New York, and North Carolina, but also from Furman, David Hills is an instructor in Colorado in the Midland Key Federation. Um, and Charles Boyer, who started at Furman, he's the head instructor of the Lokahi, Lokahi Key Society, a member dojo of the Hawaii Key Federation. So I'm saying these are like incubators. Um, so here's another one. Um, Tsubaki Sensei. Tsubaki Sensei at KU, Kansas University. So I had the pleasure of teaching there like 10 years in a row and still get to go back and friends with all of those, Labar Sensei, a dear longtime friend. Well, so I first met Dan Atwater so the person we're going to hear from also had an undergraduate experience that included a Kiai Kido club. How cool is that? So talk about Setsudo and giving back. Dan's like, oh boy, I had one. Tsubaki Sensei was when I was an undergraduate. And he's got stories and stories to share about that because that's just, that's just how it works. Here's another one. Uh, Calvin Tabata Sensei graduates from high school in Honolulu, goes to college at Lewis and Clark in Portland, What's he gonna do? Start an Aikido club. Do you know that his most senior deshi, the, the leaders of the Northwest Key Federation, Brenda Tam, Louis Sloss, John Gilmore, all senior senseis, Tam sensei, Sloss sensei, Gilmore sensei, super senior, and they were all classmates of Tabata sensei in this incubator called Lewis and Clark, because from that grew the Oregon Key Society, and from that little seed grew the Northwest Key Federation. Can you, can you tell, Dan, I'm telling a story that you're like a mustard seed out there. You have no idea how much impact you're gonna make. Well, I'm just, and I haven't even set up your talk yet. <laughs> okay, uh, also in St. Petersburg, Russia, thank you, Professor Dmit Dmitry Lanko. He's, he's also just starting uh, about the same time as you, Dan. So there's another university uh, in, the, in the works. So, let me now not stop taking up Dan's time and just do more of a formal introduction. But I want to I want to set the ask, as I said, is we're going to talk about the influence of these university clubs and Dan's experience and application in his own life. But I just want to say, uh, doing a free seminar, an hour, a half day workshop on the four basic principles is a great way. You do it and you do it effectively. You know what they're going to want? They're going to say, "Would you come and maybe teach a class here? How about this?" Kaicho Shinichi Tohei. His father founded the Keio University Kiyo Kiaikido Club. Super prestigious. And it's so important, guess what? His own son, Kaicho Shinichi Tohei Sensei, still teaches personally that club that his father founded. And that's also an incubator. Um, right there in Kansas right now, we've got, we've got uh, one of the Keio uh, students who's graduated and in business. And when he can, he, he goes there and trains with Lavar Sensei. Uh, so it's, it's a worldwide network. It's very exciting. All right, let me introduce Atwater Sensei. He holds a showdown in Aikido, of course, as I mentioned, and he's the head instructor and founder of Indiana Key Aikido since 2018, when he moved to Indiana to work as an assistant professor of biology at Earlham College. Atwater Sensei is a father, a spouse, a teacher of Aikido and biology, a researcher in plant ecology, a runner, and a visual artist. He began his Aikido training, I didn't know this, in the mid-90s with Vic Montgomery Sensei in the Midland Key Aikido Children's Program. Wow, a children's program? Come on, Dan, you're going full circle. Okay, <laughs> all right, let's see, where was it? Um, he began studying as an adult in 2001 under Tsubaki Sensei as a member of the Kansas Key Society. Uh, 
During that time, Atwater Sensei was also pursuing a bachelor's degree in organismal biology. After graduating, Atwater Sensei left Kansas and paused his formal Aikido training to complete a PhD in ecology at the University of Montana. He also lived and conducted research before his current position at the University of Nevada in Reno, uh, in Reno, Nevada, at, the, at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, Virginia, at NC State uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina, where he was able to re resume studying Aikido with Mayumi K. Sensei and Patrick Terry Sensei as a member of Raleigh Ki Aikido. Atwater Sensei is thrilled to now be in a position to share universal principles, just like the Shokshu, and foster improvement for a new group of students in Indiana. He operates Indiana Ki Aikido with the support from Earlham College, a Quaker institution which has recognized the value of Aikido in training students to embody peace and share it with the world. That's part of their mission. <laughs> so that's why I chose the Shokushu and spread it to the world. So Atwater Sensei has landed in the land of Nirvana. He's got a supportive school. He's doing great um, and he's extremely busy. And I wanna thank him for volunteering to share with us his perspective on how Key Principles has affected his life. I've seen a draft of his presentation. It's action packed. Uh, so put on your seatbelt and Atwater Sensei, you're on. Thank you very much, Sensei. And thank you all for coming today. This is funny for me. I, uh, I don't usually get nervous about things like this anymore because it's what I do for a living. But Nora's like, you're the most nervous I've seen you in a long time. <laughs> and part of that was because I expressed this anxiety originally to Shaner Sensei. You all I, I see as my teachers. So it's funny for me to get up here and you know put on my teacher hat and tell you about something. But I, I'm used to hearing it from you. <laughs> and I think, you know, Shane and Sensei helped me work through those feelings. <laughs> and I think the way I'm thinking of it now is that it's just an opportunity for me to share back what you've already taught me and how I'm applying that in my daily life. And the lens for all this is going to be running. And of course, that's not the only way that Aikido is applied to my daily life. But I think for me, it's been a really useful lens for seeing how the universal principles uh, wind up expressing themselves uh, outside the dojo. OK, so I'm going to talk, give this um, presentation in a few different parts. And what I want to start with really is the beginning. And this is the story, essentially, of how I started running, but it's also the story of how I started doing Aikido because the two wind up being entwined in my life in some really interesting ways. And although Shainer Sensei mentioned that I originally began studying Aikido with Vic Montgomery Sensei uh, when I was in middle school, my formal training as an adult started with this man, the late Tsubaki Sensei. Um, while I was a student at the University of Kansas, I studied with him for three and a half years. And um, I became very involved in the dojo. I was practicing five days a week, and I was the president of the Aikido club, and just sort of accelerating my involvement through that period of time. And Tsubaki Sensei is the person that introduced me to Aikido um, as an adult, but he's also the person that got me started running, not really on purpose. But on Sunday mornings, um, Tsubaki and Sensei and I and others um, would meet to do um, bell masogi and calligraphy and <clears throat> excuse me um, one of the things that happened as a result of this or he was kind of mixed up in this is he started he decided he wanted to have a running competition at the dojo and the prize for winning the running competition was an ink block for doing um, calligraphy so I like I was really into the calligraphy and I really wanted to win this ink block. So here's the location now of the dojo in Lawrence, Kansas. And this is the route here that we took. So we started at the back of the dojo. And we ran up this little loop that goes to a water treatment facility and back down. And it was a, about a little over half a mile run. It was the first time in my life I'd ever thought I was going to be involved in a uh, road race. So I started training for a couple of weeks before the run. And um, I just want to see if I can manage this technologically. 
I want to see if I can share the actual root here, thanks to the magic of Google Earth. Here's the dojo. Not what it, this is what it looks like now, but this is not what it looks like in my mind. <laughs> They've renovated it, done something weird with it. Here's the root. You just run down this little trail here, and the road goes back. Now we're actually back in the early 2000s, and this is what it looked like. So this is like could have been the day that we did this run. You go back here. See, come on. Come back here. Go to the end, turn around up here, and then it's heading back to the dojo. And I partly just wanted to show you this because this is like pulled out of my memory. This is literally going back in time here as we go back on these Google Earth images because this is the authentic dojo the way I remember it here, all boarded up and it was an old um, grocery warehouse. And now it's something, some fancy renovated thing. But this is the route that we did. And um, that was a race that I really wanted to win and I lost. I came in second place. This guy, <laughs> I don't know if he's still practicing Aikido. He came out of nowhere <laughs> and I had no chance. <laughs> so I won that day. And um, what I got in, in, uh, instead was this festival headband. And for me, the, I still have the festival headband. And it's this sort of like, sort of quasi mark of shame, but also became this kind of galvanizing thing for me that I was like, I wanted, I, I, was, I felt like that was mine to win. And it sort of put me on a different path of being this guy that was kind of a big couch potato to somebody that was gonna be more active. And, and I, Tsubaki Sensei had another race I knew it was coming and I trained for it. And I started running a lot more seriously then after that. So that sort of like experience, the initial disappointment is what got me started running. Um, so then I started running a lot. The race was in the winter time. That summer, I was very fortunate to have a research experiences for undergraduate thing through the NSF, which was this NSF um, sponsored program to go and do research at Harvard Forest. And that was really important professionally for me because it was uh, my first real research experience. I got two papers published out of that. I met Nora and I eventually married her. So it was you know, personally important too. I figure one summer, two publications and you meet your wife is probably um, a pretty productive summer research <laughs> experience. And the reason that I was able to do this actually was because of Tsubaki Sensei. So, um, I took a chance on my application to this program and I used two biology teachers as my letters of reference and Tsubaki Sensei. Tsubaki Sensei was a professor at the University of Kansas. He taught dance. So he had all the qualifications to be writing a letter like this. And Aikido was so important in my life that I wanted him to be one of the letter writers. And the person I wound up working for on this program had done Aikido when he was in college. And he thought anybody that would have an Aikido sensei write a letter of recommendation for an NSF RU application was worth having in the lab. <laughs> so it was literally the reason that I got that job. And actually Aikido is literally the reason why I got the job at Rowan College too. So Aikido has been um, supporting me for a long time. So this, um, this wound up being one of the most important formative experiences in my life. It was all because of Tubaki sensei. But at the same time I was going in here, I had been running. And I was a, a dorky kid. I didn't do any kind of athletics or sports or anything like that when I was growing up. I was overweight, I was out of shape, I played too many video games. Running got me in shape and it got me confidence. And I decided I would sort of reinvent myself when I went to this uh, research program. And it was a really important sort of next step in my life. So again, running in Aikido is all intertwined here for me. And uh, this was just sort of interesting. I remembering Tetsudo, I taught some Aikido classes while I was there. We had two classes a week and we just went out on the lawn and did some rolling and did key tests and did all that sort of stuff. Um, so after this, I went back, finished up um, at the University of Kansas and left Nora in Ithaca, New York. And as soon as I graduated, I ran off to go um, be with her and left Aikido behind. And um, after 2004, I didn't do Aikido again until I think 
2016 or 2017. So it was this big gap in my IPO training that started. And a lot of really important things happened to me. I got married, I bought a couple of houses, we had two kids, we had dogs and cats and all that. Started my career. It was a really productive and important time in my life. But it was also a time when I um, left IKEA behind and I started to sort of lose myself slowly. And um, there's this quote, I'm trying not to quote too heavily from um, Psycho and Tan because I know Shana Sensei told us to focus on Toy Sensei's <laughs> lessons, but I couldn't help myself. <laughs> Sorry, Sensei. <laughs> Um, so here's a quote um, from um, one of the translations. When your mind is agitated, you will lose awareness of your true nature. And of course, we all know what this feels like. I mean, my mind gets agitated um, when the dog is taking too long to go to the bathroom. I lose my true nature. But there's something that happens over long periods of time, too. Um, and as I stayed away from Aikido, I just felt myself sort of slipping away or more negative key entering my life, I think. I started to lose, uh, lose connection with myself and became grumpier and more misanthropic. And that manifested on my runs. So as you're running, you're out in the world. You're interacting with people, um, either directly or indirectly, a lot. Um, traffic and other people. And especially with cars, I, I was having negative interactions. So one, in, it, it's people, drivers don't really understand what it's like to run. Sometimes people are just too close, drive too fast, um, cut you off because they don't see you. It's something we've all done and it's something we've all experienced, but I was taking that personally. And um, there is a particular person that just without realizing I was there, I don't even remember the exact situation, cut me off, drove in front or something like that. And I just got mad and I made the um, mad sounds and mad movements, <laughs> you know, like, come on, man, what are you doing? And then um, I ran a little bit farther, half another half block or so. And actually I saw him coming out of a parking lot. And there's this moment of sort of like, it's easy to be mad at someone when you think you're never going to see them again. But then when you see them again, you sort of like, no, I was, a jerk, but he rolled his window down and he apologized. He said he didn't see me, he cut me off, he didn't mean to. And I think about this, um, we've all read this, of course, the moon is re clearly reflected in the water when the water's calm. And I've been thinking about this a lot from my perspective, how can I polish that mirror and make that calm? But I realized what happened in that moment is I, I saw myself through somebody else and through them I could see that um, my water was not calm. And that's the nice thing that, you know, what we try to do in Aikido is bring that calmness out into the world. And I was very fortunate that this individual brought that calmness into my world and showed me um, how sort of wrong I, uh, wrongly I was taking things. Um, so it wound up okay in the end, but this wasn't an uncommon interaction for me. Um, another important interaction came here. This curve is right close to the house where I lived in. Here's the picture on Google Earth from above, and then we've got the street view here. And you can see this is, um, if you think of yourself as a driver, this is a challenging curve to go around. There's not very much visibility. And where I am in this scene now is I'm running um, up. I'm running into this curve, and I'd be on the left side of the road because that's the correct place to run. So I'm on the left side of the run road, running into traffic on that side and there's a car coming the other way. And I started to get um, in, entitled about cars yielding to me when they were riding on the road, that they should go around me because I'm a pedestrian. So it, out of this sense of entitlement, I stayed where I was and I didn't get off into the grass. The car gave me room and then I realized right behind me, there was another car coming around the curve and I almost caused a serious accident by my failure to give something up or get out of the way. And so I realized that my negativity was going to have serious consequences in the real world if I didn't get my act together. Now at this time I wasn't doing Aikido, so I didn't have the tools to know what to do about it. Um, so I was fortunate then that um, not too long after this happened, we moved to North Carolina. And I don't remember exactly what happened. 
um, whether Nora is the one that thought of it or whether it crossed my mind first, but somehow we had the idea, isn't there I key Aikido in Raleigh? Um, so of course there was, so we looked into it and then almost as soon as we moved, I um, got back into Aikido and I have um, Kei Sensei and Terry Sensei and the other members of Raleigh Key Aikido to thank for um, restoring me to my natural self, <laughs> such as it is <laughs> uh, today, <laughs> um, and helping me um, see things a little bit more clearly. Um, so I'll talk about this a little bit more, but coming back to Aikido, of course, was an important um, experience in my life, and so were the important the experiences that I had beforehand. Now, what I want to do for uh, much of the rest of this is just talk about different ways that our Aikido teachings um, influence our daily life, again, through the lens of running. So the first one is running in Kyatsu, Kyatsu Ho, of course, is the, um, one of our practices. And um, this was actually a lesson I learned from that gentleman that I talked about before who came and apologized for cutting me off. So I'll say, read this quote real quickly. Let us practice kiatsu to put ki back into suffering people and give them a fresh start to happiness. And it's really interesting if you read about kiatsu, um, Toei Sensei doesn't talk much about the physicality of what you're doing, what you're doing with your thumbs. There's a little bit of that, of course, on ki in daily life. But kiatsu, if you read the, um, if you read the um, ki saying about um, kiatsu, it's, about manifesting positive key in yourself. And if you do that through your experiences with other people, you can just sort of put your key back into other people. So I think about this when I'm running. I think about the man that I um, met who apologized. And I thought, think about the per people that I almost hurt by um, bringing negative key into the world. And what I do now to sort of avoid that problem is I just, I think of it as my responsibility to protect all the other people that I'm coming across when I'm running. So just thinking about this, thinking about doing kiatsu when I'm running, express, putting a positive key in myself and bringing that key out to the world has given me a different perspective that has totally erased um, the negative feelings that I used to have, almost totally erased those negative feelings. And what I do, for example, when I've got oncoming traffic is instead of in my mind wondering, do I yield or do I stick to my guns and make them go around me. Instead, I think, how can I best protect these people who, who might be in danger because of my actions? Um, so I'll do things like change sides of the road, get out of the way, that kind of stuff. It's totally changed things for me. Um, running and key breathing was something that I played around with a lot, especially a few years ago. Um, so in key and daily life, Toei Sensei says, when you've gotten to the point where you can practice your breathing method while sitting, you can practice it anywhere. Um, whether you're standing, sitting in a chair, or walking along, lying down. And you can do key breathing while you're running too, of course. Um, and when I first started trying to do key breathing while I was running, what I um, did was almost pass out. <laughs> because when you're running, you need a lot of air. <laughs> and if you're breathing, if I'm doing five steps on the in-breath, five steps on the out-breath, and making sure I have a good seishi at the end, and then coming back in, pretty soon I'm out of oxygen. And actually, one time I tried this, and I was like, Dan, just go through it. Just keep keep doing the seishi and see what happens. And I started to actually feel physically ill. Your body needs oxygen. And of course, key breathing is not about starving your body of oxygen. It's about breathing while you're relaxed. And it's sort of like, one of the reasons I love running as a lens for viewing the key principles is it exposes a lot of my misconceptions. If my misconception about key breathing is that it's about trying to hold my breath for a long time, what, running is very nice because it lets me know that I'll kill myself if I try to do that. But if I key breathe correctly, <laughs> then it is a positive experience. <laughs> so I think it's really interesting. Um, writing and meditation. Meditation is something that I do um, sometimes when I'm running. I don't do it all the time. Sometimes I just don't feel like it. Um, but especially on long runs, it can be really nice uh, to try to meditate while running. And of course, um, this is the quote from Toei Sensei, once you understand that you have the center of the universe in your abdomen, try to begin every action from this point, absorb everything and every influence into this point, and you can keep coordination of mind and body in your daily life. There's nothing that stops you from keeping one point at any given time. There's nothing that stops you from meditating in different scenarios. 
And um, I found running to be a really productive um, environment for meditating. There's something about it, if I get on a straight and narrow path and there's trees going by and there's a sort of a rhythm to it, I'm not having to think about too much technically where my feet are going, um, then it's, um, it can be really conducive to meditating. So I um, really enjoy doing that. And you can do key meditation really easily while you're running. Another sort of interesting parallel I noticed between running and Aikido is racing, racing and key testing. Um, the experience of racing, if you're racing against somebody that's just faster or just slower than you, you you're, there's not a strong connection. But if you're racing with somebody that's close to the same speed as you, then you can make a really strong connection with that person. And um, you can see the state of, of their mind really, really clearly. So we already know that um, you, know, you can ex experience the state of another person's mind through their body. And we'll, we learn through key testing that we can find that with a touch. And of course, you can see it with your eyes too. And there's something about the connection that you make with somebody while you're racing that you can just, you can see right into their mind if you make that connection. And um, when you're racing with somebody, there's a, a period of time where it's almost like if you can just sort of decide it's mine now, it's mine to win. And they will just yield. And it's like a decision you make together. I'm gonna win this one. At some point they, they give in and you, you take the lead. And that happens when you um, do what we do, <laughs> find your one point, extend your key. If you do that the most, if you have the lowest one point, you're the one that's going to sort of um, have control over that exchange. It's just an interesting thing. I don't think racing and key testing are exactly the same, um, but there's a very similar feeling. For example, winning a race with somebody is a very similar feeling to the feeling of walking through a key test. Like we're doing the, um, have someone put their hand on your chest and you walk forward. The feeling of winning a race mentally is very similar to that feeling of just pushing through um, the hand. So it's another area where I see Aikido principles coming into um, running. I want to talk a little bit about um, the different orders of awareness that um, Shainer Sensei and others have been discussing a lot lately. And these certainly come into play in running. So just as sort of a review, third order of awareness is where I think I spend most of my life, just lots of information coming in. Um, just taking things as they come. Second order awareness being um, focusing on a single thing and then third or first order awareness being um, when that sort of subject object distinction falls away. And these different orders of awareness are orders of things that I'll experience a lot during runs, especially third and second order awareness. And the sort of experience of running depends on the type of running that um, I'm doing. So there's especially when I'm training for a race, there's a lot of different types of runs that I'll do. Um, interval runs or runs where you just go really fast or on a track, you go really fast for a short distance, cool down, go fast again, maybe do like 10 or 12, 400 meter intervals. Um, tempo runs are, are um, runs where you start slow and then you have this really kind of quick pace in the middle and then go slow again. And these kinds of runs that are really fast pace, um, I spend a lot of time in second order awareness when I'm doing this kind of running. It's too um, difficult for third order awareness to be very useful. So I tend to um, try to find second order awareness so that I can get through the run because it's, it's taxing enough that um, third order awareness is hard to endure when you're trying to push yourself really hard. Um, so I'll get into second order awareness usually by focusing on my pace or focusing on where I'm trying to run. Um, and I'll tend to save first order awareness or trying to get to first order awareness for my last interval. Um, and how I'll do that when I'm interval training is something I've heard said at the dojo where you, um, when you wake up in the morning, like before a, a test, when you wake up in the morning, it's already done. I try to think, I'm on my second to last run. The last interval is already done. I don't have to think about it. I just need to execute. And something will go through my mind and I'll just think, we're gonna be able to do it in this pace. And it feels like this kind of automatic process and first order awareness sort of starts to come into it. I have a lot of trouble um, finding it on 
boring slow runs. Um, but long runs at a relaxed pace where you really settle into a rhythm are really good for meditation and really good for finding first order awareness. Um, to get to first order awareness on a run, um, no, I, I thought about um, the key principles and I couldn't think of anything to add. <laughs> I mean, to get to first order awareness on a run, you just follow the key principles um, or, you know, or second order awareness. Relax completely um, and keep weight underside are two that um, I tend to use the least. Um, but it's interesting, I found out, I, I was playing with keep weight underside on Sunday and I realized that every time I thought keep weight underside, um, I lost a little bit of posture. I started to slouch and I lost a little bit of power in my step. I could feel that change. Um, and it was because I was collapsing when I was uh, trying to find keep weight underside. And that was just a really nice thing to experience because um, it showed me that I've had this misconception about keep weight underside for the longest time. Um, and there's something really nice about an activity that you've just done so much that you can just tell these really small differences in. And I've just recently been discovering, actually since starting working on this lecture, I've been discovering that running is a really good laboratory for testing my understanding of the key principles. Um, keep one point is something that I use sometimes if I'm um, really tired, I'll just think of the one point and think of running from the one point instead of running from my head or something like that. And that can help me um, find second order and first order awareness when I'm really tired. But the one that I do the most by far is extend key. And I think this must be my natural um, inclination because I tend to think extend key in the dojo also when I'm um, practicing with the key principles. Uh, I'll go to that one. And there's a lot that I found to be useful on a run, um, just extending key to a point ahead, if it's the finish line or if it's a tree or something like that, just extend key to it and run to it. Um, I, I can extend key to a pace, to try to maintain a pace or a rhythm. Um, thinking through the fingers and toes is really useful. Thinking about the hips um, moving forward or moving up is really helpful. Um, just kind of connecting to the world around and expanding my awareness to all sides is um, also really useful for getting into first order awareness. Um, but for me, always the most potent is um, the, remembering the feeling that I uh, got with Tsuwaki Sensei doing Sokushin no Byo. Um, if I remember to just think about that feeling, I can just um, find first order awareness really quickly sometimes. Um, so that's just a nice thing to be able to do. And it's just wonderful gift um, that I think that you all have given me because being able to um, go on a run and then just find that kind of universal joy um, at any time is really nice. Um, another thing I think about when I'm running sometime is the rank criteria. Um, so especially when I was studying for Shodan, I was thinking about the rank criteria a lot, and I was trying to work hard to bring those into daily life. So I was thinking she sen, she say, especially uh, she sen and she say in my eye, my eye a lot, um, getting ready for Shodan. And it was really useful in running. Um, and again, exposing my uh, misunderstandings, because my first times practicing she say during runs, I was just thinking horizon, look out the horizon. <laughs> and then, I am tripping <laughs> constantly because I was um, ignoring uh, what was going on with my feet. And when you're running a lot, you need to look down at your feet to make sure you're not going to step over something. So um, reconciling looking out with, well, your awareness actually needs to be where it needs to be. And it needs to be out and not necessarily just straight out, but everywhere um, was really useful for helping me kind of grapple with what she say meant um, for my training. And it's nice because it sets habit that um, I've been able to use in daily life. I see the sky a lot more now as a result. Um, but I don't trip more often <laughs> either because <laughs> I do look down when I need to. Um, and she say posture is important when you're running. It's also, it's just sort of a universal thing. Um, I don't think she's thinking about posture particularly um, made, it, made a difference for my running as compared to she sen, which is really helpful. Um, but my eye is an interesting one. Um, 
it's really possible to detect lapses in your key while running. If you just sort of, if you let your key go, if you let your mind wander, you're in third order awareness immediately and your running gets really sloppy too. Um, sometimes it's just nice to be able to be in third order awareness <laughs> and have sloppy running. <laughs> um, but um, there, I realized there were a lot of times where my, um, my key extension was lapsing and I was feeling to maintain kind of my eye um, with my surroundings. And that was um, useful to think about too. And actually, it never even occurred to me to think about neon criteria on a run until I started preparing this lecture. So on Sunday, I played around with um, straight up and down um, just to see what it did for my running. And it had a really wonderful effect of um, drawing my spine up and extending my posture. And um, it's something that I'm gonna have to get used to because if I think straight up and down, um, it's tiring. I, I wind up running a little bit faster and I'm finding it to be a little bit mentally tiring. So I guess that's a, um, a sign I need to work on it more. But it's really fun to play with these um, right criteria while running. Um, so that's sort of how IPO has influenced my running. And I wanna talk now really briefly about how running has um, influenced my IPO practice. And, it's interesting because um, if you read Kean Daily Life and if you read the key sayings, Toei Sensei doesn't say much specifically about the state of the body. It's so much is about the mind and our connection. Um, but having a, um, having a strong body and one that's uh, having endurance helps. Um, a couple of quotes I found, before you lead the mind of others, you must be able to control your own mind and body freely. And I can just tell you from my personal experience, getting in better shape and getting stronger um, has made my life easier. And it's made it easier for me to um, find relaxation because um, I can count on my body. And I think about the body sort of the, it's like, I think I'm a car enthusiast and the body's sort of where the rubber meets the road. It's the tire. It's where your mind is connecting to the universe through your body. Um, so having a, having a, a willing partner is, um, helps me. Uh, as, as my partner has become more willing, my, my training has improved, my experience training has improved. Um, <clears throat> I guess a material example of that um, is when I was doing Joan Boken uh, Taigi with Tsubaki Sensei. So when I was a student kind of towards the end of when I was an undergraduate, um, Tsubaki Sensei taught an Aikido class and I was helping him with the class. And as part of that, he was dragging me down to the racquetball courts at the University of Kansas, and I was doing Joe and Boken Taigi in the racquetball courts. And Tsubaki Sensei would just watch with this kind of scowl <laughs> the entire time, and he'd just say, bigger, 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 bigger. He just wanted it bigger and bigger and bigger. And he would say to me, um, you think you're, you're doing everything big, but it's not big enough. It needs to be bigger, bigger, bigger. And um, I had problems with bigness because I wasn't very strong. I, like I say, when I, I was a couch potato, I was overweight when I was young, um, and I didn't have the strength to kind of move. And I mean, I'm sure there's, there's mental elements there too, but I was struggling with it. And after I came back, actually, when I left Aikido for about a year, I was really running a lot. Um, Nora is a, um, NCAA rowing champion. And she and I were running a lot together. Um, so I came back to the University of Kansas just to visit Tsubaki Sensei after I graduated. It was a year, year and a half after I graduated. And the dojo had already moved at that point in time. And um, I'd been out of Aikido for a while and I was really rusty. But I had been doing a lot of running. And so I did this. Uh, the Joe and Boken Taigi for Tsubaki Sensei. He asked me to do it one time, sort of last thing. Had class and then he said, do the Taigi for me. So I did the Joe and Boken Taigi for him. And it was really, really rusty and <laughs> sloppy, but it was really big because my leg muscles had gotten strong and Tsubaki Sensei just had the biggest smile on his face because I'd finally gotten the bigness <laughs> that, he, that he wanted. And that was the last time I saw Tsubaki Sensei. So for me, that was a really important memory. Um, and part of the reason it's been easy to keep going because it's easy to see the, the effect that it's had um, on my life, running, I mean. Um, so now I wanna talk a little bit about running for the future. Um, so 
Nora and I have run, um, I think, 12 marathons together. Every single marathon I've run, it's been with Nora, and we've always started and finished at the same time. It's just an important thing that we've done together. I tr don't like talking about running because uh, I find it makes people uncomfortable. Um, I don't like to feel like I'm bragging about something. And sometimes it, if people don't run, and I tell, talk to them about it. I feel like they feel guilty. I get, <laughs> they'll say things to me like, well, sometimes they'll say something like this. I could never run, run a marathon. It's just gotta be too hard. A lot of people have this mental block. Marathon, nope, impossible. It's too hard to do. Um, running a marathon actually isn't very hard. I don't say that flippantly. Running a marathon isn't hard when you've trained for a marathon. Running a marathon fast is hard, but just running a marathon, if you've trained for a marathon, running a marathon is something that anybody can do. Um, training is hard. And thinking about this got me thinking about, um, well, as I was reading on P and Daily Life, this resonated. So Tsubaki, or Tsubaki, Toei Sensei mentioned uh, three ways to win. Winning after fighting, fighting after winning, and winning without fighting. And winning after fighting means that you just sort of get in there and you fight it out and win, or whatever, whatever happens. You, you got in there and you fought it out. Fighting after winning means you've sort of done pr preparation. You've done your work and you've, you've prepared, you've envisioned the win, and then, um, and then you go in and fight. <laughs> it's still a little bit of a fighting mind in there. Winning without fighting means that, that there's no point of fighting ever. You, you, you begin and end already having won. And um, when I thought about this, I thought number two sounds a whole lot like trust your training. And number three sounds a whole lot like um, first order awareness. So I just want to sort of relate this a little bit to first order awareness. Winning after fighting is like making it happen. You just make it happen. And I know people that run marathons like just got off the couch and tried to run a marathon. And they crossed the finish line and, and they hated themselves for a week because they were in pain. Um, Fighting after winning is like trust your training. And I guess this is where how I sort of envision marathons. Well, the hard parts, the hard parts at the beginning, the hard parts in the training. And once you go out and run the marathon, the marathon's easy because you've already sort of done the fighting ahead of time. The marathon just sort of becomes the expression of all that work you did leading up to it for, for half a year. Um, and then winning without fighting really sounds like um, first order awareness. The marathon's already run itself. You just participate. You just get to go have the experience now. Um, it's already done and won by the time you wake up in the morning. And um, through talking with Shainer Sensei, this is really interesting because the third order awareness, make it happen, is very much a present only mindset. Not really thinking about the future. Just, all right, now it's time. Now I got to fight it out. Very much in the present. Fighting after winning is very much in the future, future directed. Well, I've decided I want to do this thing, and now I figure out how to do it. Um, and yet first order awareness is back in the present um, because it all just, it, you realize it's all just sort of one and the same. Um, so I thought it's an interesting, this idea of finding first order awareness is, is about <laughs> going back and finding your original nature, but somehow it seems important to go into second order awareness before you can come back to the first order awareness and come back to your nature. Another thing people say often when I tell them, talk to them about running is that, well, they'll say it's hard on the body. Why make yourself suffer? My mom still thinks I'm crazy. She doesn't know why I would ever go and be uncomfortable for three hours at a time. Um, and what, why, <laughs> why would you do that? Um, and a lot of people will say, if I mention running, a lot of things that people talk about is, well, I can't do it if my knees hurt or, or I want to be able to walk when I'm older. Um, I think probably it's helpful for, for later in life, but why make yourself suffer? Um, a lot of it's not suffering. This is a picture, of one of my runs is the Salisbury Road and it's beautiful. I like being out. It doesn't feel like suffering too often when I'm doing it. And I was thinking about this a, a few months ago, running, running by trees. I'm a tree biologist, a plant biologist. And I wanted to share a little bit about these trees. So this is tulip tree, this is a state tree of Indiana. Here, here's a picture of it um, before leaf out in the winter and then leaf out in the spring in April. And this tree is receiving all these cues from the environment to let it know, now's, now's the time. It's warming up, light's changing. Now it's the time to start moving the sugars around and start uh, putting water pressure in the leaves and starting to grow again. 
when the tree flowers, it's responding to cues about what color the light is, how long the day is, what the, what the temperature is like. All these cues are being integrated to determine when it's gonna flower. So I don't think people realize this, but plants are sensing their environment constantly. And um, they can see the color of the light. They can see the direction of the light. They can sense gravity. They can tell how warm it is. They can smell the air around them. They know um, what insects are on them. They know what insects are eating them. They can smell whether there's predators for those insects nearby. They can smell what the identity is of their neighboring plants. They communicate for their, through their roots and they can tell what species the other plants are that are growing next to them. Um, this is white bark pine. This is one of Nora's study species when she was a doctoral student at the University of Montana. This is a fairly typical um, subalpine um, meadow of white bark pine trees that are large. Here's a, a white bark pine that's actually above tree line in Glacier National Park. And this tree is probably at 8,500 feet or so, way above tree line. This tree here could be 150 years old. And it's never going to grow any bigger than that because it's in this highly marginal environment where the growing season is only a month or two. Um, and I just think about the trees and they're experiencing so much. Of course, they don't have brains, so who knows what their experience is like. But they're experiencing, they're so deeply connected to the world around them. A tree is connected to a fungal community that connects it to other trees. It may be connected to one or 200 other trees through, through this fungal communities. And information and nutrients are being exchanged through those communities. Deeply connected organisms that exist through these connections without suffering. So I think about the trees and I think here's an example of something that can exist and be very much a part of the universe but not be suffering while it's in the universe. So that's a nice thing to um, aspire towards. <laughs> And I think about what does it take to be a tree? <laughs> um, living calmness. Calmness in action is the real calmness from King Daily Life. The first koan in the Gateless Gate is a monk asked Joshua in all earnestly, earnestness, does a dog have a Buddha nature or not? And Joshua said, moo. <laughs> What's so special about the tree, the dog? They've got Buddha nature. Why don't I? <laughs> Why do I have to work so hard to find first order awareness? Um, contentment should be tested in a world of vanity. Calmness should be investigated in a place of turmoil. We need to find that turmoil so that we can find our inner peace. Um, when I was at University of Kansas, you know, I was doing calligraphy class with Tsubaki Sensei, and um, Fukushima, Fukushima Kato Roshi came to Kansas while I was there, and he did a private Enso um, calligraphy. And I was very fortunate to be able to see that. When I think about Enso, I think about starting and leaving and coming back. And there's something so wonderful about going out and coming back and finding yourself again. On a run, I go out, but I always come home. <laughs> in Aikido, I left and then came back. I was talking to Chin Sensei about this in Las Vegas, at the Las Vegas seminar. And I think Chin Sensei could tell there was a hole in my heart from leaving Aikido. Immediately, he said, that had to happen. That was very good that that happened. And I just was like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> What's that supposed to mean? So I thought about it for a long time. I don't think I have the riddle completely cracked yet, but I think this is part of it. Leaving and coming back makes being here so much sweeter. It gives me such, so much better perspective on what Aikido can offer my life. Um, so I think about that too, and I think about that when I'm running. And that's what I'm doing um, when I'm running. And I just wanted to end with sort of the real reason I do this. Running's a family affair, obviously. Nora and I run together uh, as much as we can. Um, there's family support. We can't do anything without support from our families. And they're the reason that I run too. Um, I don't wanna ever have to say, I can't do it, Nate, I'm too tired. <laughs> can't go on that hike with you. I can't do that thing with you. I always wanna be able to be there for my kids. And, I was born with congenitally high blood pressure. It's not a problem for me. I manage it with running. Um, my father died when I was 12, and I don't want to leave my children behind. So running is an important way for me, too, to stay connected to my future and give the gift to my future self of um, being able to enjoy my time with these people. Uh, so that's all I've got. I think 
I promised I'd leave some time for questions. I think I left six minutes for questions. I hope that's okay, Shane or Sensei. <laughs> Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Dan. That was remarkable. Um, that was incredible. <laughs> yeah, I, I, there are uh, no questions. And I have a question. anyone, if you were like me, you didn't want to go to the keyboard. So if someone does have a question, uh, I, have a I don't have a question per se, but I just wanted to say that I used to be a runner. Um, I had to give it up in my mid 20s because I destroyed my knees. But uh, I really found this uh, to be inspiring and, and where I could have taken running and Aikido had I, you know, had the knees to continue. So thank you. Uh, Rich, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, sorry. So uh, I have a question, but I'm not going to ask the question. While you've been talking, Dan, I've been looking at John Popoli, who's been smiling and nodding, and his posture is up because he loves nature as much as anybody, and he's knowledgeable about um, you know, if you want to take a walk in a forest, I now know that in addition to John Popoli, I want to go with you, Dan, because you're ending there talking about what plants sense and communicate. That was like the price of admission right there, man. And then the last Enzo coming and coming back, that's priceless. So you ended with a kabang, in my opinion anyway, super interesting talk and wonderful preparation. But I, I would like to ask Popoli Sensei just if you had any kind of reaction or question or comment, because not only is Pop, Popoli Sensei a naturalist, I'll just say, but he knows what endurance sports are like uh, from a biking perspective. So um, he, he knows about all that pain and working through pain. And so Popoli Sensei, do you have something to share? Yeah, thanks for putting me on the spot, Sensei. Um, <laughs> I, uh, no, I um, it was just really, I was just really inspired by that. Uh, you know, Atwater Sensei, your your humility and self honesty is inspiring. Um, and um, you know, I just I just typed in the comments here this this word shizendo. You know, Shaner Sensei and I have had a couple of conversations about you know what is this like this path that is that is live the the. You know, the the way of living one's life life naturally the way of living one's life with you know, being fed by the natural world and inspired by the natural world and and so we've 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 just tossed back and forth this uh you know shizen as a doll shizen as a path so so shizendo um uh, i've got i've, I've no, nothing to add at water sensei it was beautiful Well, that was fantastic. Any, anybody else have a, a comment? Um, hi, Sensei. This is Adam. Um, I guess I, I'm just really curious. Do you, are you always alone with your thoughts or, or maybe as well with your wife when you do a training run? Are you, are you ever bringing out headphones or are you just like working over these ideas as you go? Because I just like the distances that you're talking about. I'm I'm fascinated to know how much you're ruminating on them and using them as, as like a focal point versus just other, other things you do to pass the time. Yeah, I mean, I think my mind's all over the place. It really depends on the run and what I feel like doing. Um, sometimes I feel like, um, sometimes third order is just fine. <laughs> I just, I don't mind thinking about something that I have to do, um, it, even though it's not helping me run, you know. Um, I don't listen to music, I think because I find it too distracting. I think my preference is to be more in the sort of second order mode um, versus third order. And I find music is just an unnecessary ad. I'm, there's so much information that's coming from the body um, that it just doesn't get boring for me unless I'm injured and I'm running really slowly. Then I get bored out of my mind. And that's when I should just say, Dan, why don't you meditate? <laughs> you know, there's no reason to be bored. Um, but it's really inspiring. It really is. Yeah. I, I remember, there's something else I was going to say, but I don't remember. So it must not have been important. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Okay, Rich, are we, uh, are we we're, done? We're hundred percent. Thank you, everybody. Chances, any last words or any um, teases for next week? Well, next week we'll have a big surprise. Our, our eldest uh, wise person, uh, Colonel Bob Gardner Sensei, who will turn 92 on September 1st. Uh, we'll be doing our class tomorrow. Uh, Gardner Sensei, would you like to tee anything up? I see you there on the screen. You wanna unmute yourself and uh, give us a, a preamble? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yep. Um, <clears throat> no, I, I, uh, I think we'll just uh, see what happens next week. Uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm not a, a, a silver-tongued uh, orator, as some of you are, so, uh, but um, I've got a few thoughts that I might throw out and uh, uh, see what happens. Well, uh, Gardner Sensei is an inspiration to me uh, because uh, well, he, here's a little teaser. He's done martial arts for over 70, 70 years. Uh, so long before he started uh, Aikido, he had already studied other arts. Uh, he's uh, just an incredible inspiration to me, and he continues to actively teach, uh, obviously, the, as head instructor, co-head instructor with Fan Sensei of the Loudoun Valley uh, Ki Aikido. But he teaches how many days a week, uh, Bob, like three, four, or maybe like three days, but six classes, an unbelievable amount of Tai Chi as well. Yeah, I teach four, four days a week before the, uh, before the, uh, the yeah. virus thing came along, but uh, uh, four days a week. You know. So do you suppose that keeps you young? Uh, I don't know. It makes keep me tired sometimes. <laughs> Okay, well, well, anyway, um, so maybe it's the case that today we just heard from our youngest uh, chronologically head instructor, and maybe next week we're going to hear from our eldest chronologically head instructor. So I, uh, I'm really excited about that. I hope all of you have a wonderful week. Um, love one another and be good to each other, and uh, I love you too. So see you next week.